Welcome to episode 556 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm in Hilton, and to be warned, this is one of those late nights because I do live in the United States, so the Super Bowl is basically a holiday here, and for me, a good chance to see some friends who don't watch Barcelona with me regularly when I'm watching on the weekend, so a nice time to see them. Unfortunately, American football, as you know, takes forever, so I do appreciate your patience with the match review, and I will have you know that I did subject my friends to that barcelona Granada match before we watched the big American game. So someone has been punished today just beyond kool aids They came out of it asking why Granada isn't in the Champions League. That was the question that I got because of just how good Granada looks and their expectations of what FC Barcelona is. And of course, one of the questions I come out of it with is how the heck could this Barcelona side advance in the Champions League? And that's one of the big questions I think we'll get into today. I was a bit more focused on friends, to be honest with you, than I was in finding the best numbers and stats like I usually do this time around. Honestly, some people prefer that because I throw too many numbers out at people. So this one's more about the vibes and almost the feelings I had of watching the game with other people who kind of expected better of FC Barcelona. So let's dive in the five headlines from Barcelona's 3-3 draw with Granada. Headline one is nothing complicated. I wrote that maybe too early in this match, but I stick by it because throughout this game, at least it should have not felt so complicated, even if it did. Of course, we're saying this in hindsight. But it seemed like on paper, even rotating Araujo, Inigo Martinez back in, and the return of Ter Stegen, with Granada losing Brian Zaragoza to Bayern Munich, who you remember had a brace and scored the only two goals against Barca last time. With Granada in this 5-4-1, the medium block with some pressure, Granada is not a great team. There is space to be had, and what Barcelona needed to do was take advantage of that space and put the ball in the back of the net and not concede. Have a good enough defensive shape themselves to not give up goals. The return of Ter Stegen... I did think that was going to help. We saw he got a little bit dribbly or in his bag early. I can't make the excuse, though, that Araujo was out, even if I could make that excuse, because I don't think Ter Stegen or Araujo, if you swap Inaki Pena back in for Ter Stegen, I think the same result happens. And in this case today, it's not necessarily a compliment to Ter Stegen. So in the inverse of that, I didn't really feel comfortable with the idea of scapegoating Inaki Pena. But I was at least in this match hoping for some improvement with Ter Stegen back in the team. I had mentioned on set pieces that Inaki Pena struggled there. His communication with Araujo was rough. So with Araujo not out there, I guess I couldn't see that improve at all. And I will also say that because Inaki Pena is the backup, you should expect a slight improvement between the top guy and the backup. That's why Ter Stegen makes top guy money. And he did have one good save in the game and one great save that we'll talk about, but it was still a pretty up and down day for the German from the opening five minutes. The other things to note in the first 10 minutes, of course, was that Chris and Sick continued on as the defensive midfielder. And I had said on the podcast, and I'm glad that Xavi did it, that looking ahead even to Napoli, the four midfielders with Pedri and Goodwin playing higher, and then De Jong, of course, playing a little bit deeper with Christensen, with Christensen just kind of staying and shielding, or supposed to be shielding that back line. I think that is the best we'll say system moving forward with the people that Xavi has at his disposal without the likes of Gabi this year. And then with Napoli in what is now what a week and a half or two weeks time, I guess it would be. Yeah. Two weeks to tomorrow. So it was smart for Xavi to use this Granada game as another experiment or we'll say situation for Christensen to prove that he does belong there and try to see if you can get the competition higher and higher. But Granada gave him all that he could handle And while I'm at a loss here, you can say it in the comments below. I actually want to hear what people think. If because of this kind of result that you immediately jump to throwing out the Christensen thing, or you say, hey, let's do it one more time against Celta de Vigo. Hopefully it works out. It did have its good moments today, but hopefully it works out. And then whatever works, it's Napoli and you throw what you might think might be the best against the wall. And if you're out of the Champions League, because that might be the best that you have. I know it's a run-on question, but basically give me your thoughts on Christensen at defensive midfield. I didn't really have any glaring notes. Domingo and I really went long on our opinions here just two days ago. And believe it or not, for once, I don't really have too much to add to that conversation. And this match, 3-3 even, did not really move me from that opinion. And Barcelona did struggle to capitalize on any of that space early on in the game. Koundé and Lamine Mall, there were miscues on passes that broke down Barca transitions. And in the ninth minute, Lewandowski played through Gundogan just a little too much and The bright side here was that you could see what one-touch passing and the space even that Granada's defenders and initials were allowing Barcelona to receive the ball in, and they didn't even have to take that second touch to spin off the defender. They could just play it through one touch, and they were getting in behind. Again, Granada is not a good team, and there were so many moments in this match when I said, this is not a good team, Barcelona should be winning this match. Headline two is Lamine Mall at the back post. We're going to talk about more negative stuff, but the second headline is the one that I get to wax, that enjoyable poetic about Lamine Mall, the 16-year-old prodigy, 
super prospect at this point, whatever you want to call him. In the 13th minute, he kind of started to find the game after I said an early miscue. The medium all really good work coming in. Just a little too far on the attempt for the Lewandowski tap-in. And Granada, I thought, credit sometimes to them. I thought they stepped well with their high line, and they got forward. But that didn't save them from the 1-0. 14th minute, Pedri played through De Jong one time, as I said, against Granada. They weren't necessarily playing a low block. So with a five medium block, you've heard me say it through the years, if a team with Granada's, we'll say, lack of quality, do play a medium block with five at the back, with the talent that Barcelona has, they should be able to exploit, especially those half spaces between the right wing back and the left wing back, in between the right center back then and the left center back. You understand what I'm saying? And Barcelona were able to do that, again, through Pedri and De Jong. Just one time passing, gets it all done. They get it into Lewandowski, who couldn't get the shot off. It's mini cleared a little bit, and then really good work. Once again, one touch stuff, Pedri, De Jong, Cancelo. And then Cancelo, the cutback, Lamini Mall, a simple run to the back post, and a perfect finish. Just what you want from the mini mall. Goals that come easy. On the other side, 19th minute, there was a mistake from Ter Stegen that almost early on would have canceled out the goal by Lamini Mall. Granada on the attack. Luckily, there were blocks from Kunde and Christensen. And it's a weird thing because I want to criticize Barcelona's structure, but I will also say that defense doesn't have to be pretty. And I've complained about this before. I've complained about this with Frankie de Young in particular as to why he even winds up being in the right spot and reads the game rather well defensively, but then he doesn't do the ugly thing, either the block or the step in, and it seems like defense has to be pretty for Barcelona, but it doesn't. Blocks and all that stuff, I know Granada had a little bit of life, but you get a block, you clear it out, and you restart, okay. and then you put that pressure on. Put the pedal to the metal, get the legs up, and work hard. The blocks happen, and yet Barcelona still had to keep clearing it. But having Mirto Uzuni score a bicycle kick or an almost bicycle kick against you at home, that is the most 2024 Barcelona thing I can think of. And while that didn't happen in that moment, of course, goals were to come. 35th minute, Kobarsi got the ball, but he was close to getting into some trouble for the foul on Uzuni. But still, even with that one error, I think there was once again, and I waxed poetic about Kobarsi on that show with Domogoy as well. So I take you back to Friday, where we went really long on Christensen, defensive midfielder, and Kobarsi. And I thought Kabarsi and Lamine Wall were Barcelona's two best players in that first half, at least. 41st minute, this really should have been the game. Barca should have gone up 2-0 here. And this is all credit to a former Barcelona player, former Barca B at the time player in Martin Hongla, a goal line save against Lewandowski. And I don't really blame Lewandowski here. I think there was enough pace. He got enough on the cross. This is just an incredible goal line save by Hongla. And at that point, you say it, the Barcelona cannot buy a goal. Gunawan was the one getting in behind this time. This was a almost goal that was built by Pedri. Lamini Mall got the switch over to Pedri, and then the back heel to Gunawan. So easy stuff. Not complicated, I said, from Barcelona, but they didn't find the back net, which does seem to be the most complicated thing for them in the Liga, even though there are only two off the leading getters in the Liga, which is Real Madrid and Girona, with 52 apiece. I won't give you the conceding number just yet. We'll get to that in a second. Headline three is always a roller coaster, and this is what it is being a Kool-Aid in 2024. The 1-1, one, one, it's just a cross in. Pedri was out wide defending, seemingly feeling like he was going to step in and get the ball, but that thing he does so well, which I do think he orients his body well and wins physical duels on the ground that he shouldn't, and yet I don't think he understood he was that deep. I mean, he should have, and if he didn't, that's a mistake on Pedri. I felt like he kept backtracking and expected himself to step forward and win that tackle, but it never happened. And so he just kept backtracking and backtracking and didn't move his hips the right way. So Palestri crossed it in. And that was former La Masia player Ricard Sanchez at the near post. And I know there's going to be some hate from Pedri in the comments below. And I've picked my moments when I've defended him. And I do feel like that moment does sum up his season, though, in the good and the bad. He's involved on the offensive end on one end, but then the ball doesn't find the back of the net. Then now we have to once again have a referendum on what he doesn't bring to the team because that end product has not been there, whether that's his fault or not. And this is also poor defending by Barcelona and not putting it all on Pedri allowing the cross. The center backs, they'd completely collapsed and Christensen did not slide over quick enough to stop the run from Ricard. Either your left center back in Kubarsi had to step to Ricard at that moment and read that run or Christensen, which it really should have been Christensen, had to read that later run into the box towards the near post and get in between yourself and the ball. That's got to be a block. I, I feel like so many other teams are going to block that shot, that being Christensen. It doesn't have for Barcelona. They're just never in the right spots. 
49th minute, you could tell at of the half that Xavi had given them a good screaming. You could just feel it in the energy on the sideline from Xavi. And 49th minute, this also proven to me because Christensen looked to run in behind, which is not what you see too often. And then Kubarsi was the one who tried to feed him. And I do think that Xavi probably gave some kind of speech to the effect of, it doesn't matter who you are, where you fit in this team, where you want to play, where you do play, run into the space against Granada and do it with conviction. I'm not worried about getting beat. Well, maybe he should have been, but I'm not saying he said this, but the point is you got to run. Offensively, we have to take this game by the horns. 53rd minute, Lewandowski tried to do that. Shot went wide, tough angle. And 57th minute, Ter Stegen keeps himself upright and gets the save at the near post. This was the good save I was talking about earlier. The 2-1 certainly did not go with whatever Xavi happened to say at halftime. Kabarsi and Kunde both failing to clear it. Uzuni puts it back in, and Diego Martinez was ball-watching at the back post. So once again, plenty of blame to go around here, and Pelesi was right there for the easy tap-in there at the back post. Unfairly or maybe fairly, I watched Bayer Leverkusen destroy Bayern Munich yesterday, and unfortunately checked out the highlights from Real Madrid versus Girona. Madrid was bolstered I thought by tremendous performances, especially Vinny Jr. and that back line. But I can also look at Bellingham and Vinny Jr. and praise that individual quality being the difference. And this is not me throwing shade on Real Madrid. They individually yesterday against Girona were a class above, a class above Girona and clearly deserved to win that match with some of the best players in Spain. Yet for Leverkusen, having watched that match against Bayern Munich in totality, their passes of play were a thing to behold. And such a beautiful way they had about finding the solution to play the ball out of their own half. And that's what it is. When the other team is pressing you, it doesn't matter if it's Bayern Munich or whoever's at the bottom of the Bundesliga table at the moment or in Spain, Kitty, or Granada or whoever, Almeria. But when you're playing the ball out of the back, like everybody does from the fourth divisions up, when you're playing the ball out of the back, you have a problem. It's their pressure, whatever pressure they're putting on you or the lack of pressure in them sitting in. And your solution is how do we get through that, especially in our own half of the field. And Leverkusen, they're so confident about it. They understand each other so well. They get across midfield with so much confidence just about every time. Then I watch Barca today and I think, why are the simple things so tough? I said, not complicated against a team like Granada. And it's why Kool-Aids are so divided on what this team is and even what this team can be in the future. Like, how bad is this situation? Because it feels terrible, but in those same moments, there are positive arguments that I can make. Because when you see it make sense, especially against a team as poor as Granada, in those moments, they're just pinging around like pinball and everything looks good. You say, why do they not do that every time in every progression of play? Why does the score, this is the better question, why does the score not reflect the best moments for Barcelona? And why are they punished for not even the bad moments, but the mediocre moments or the just not good enough moments. It seems like they are punished for each of those every single time. Why? Someone asked me last week if this was the most frustrating season covering the team and watching every match since I started doing this in 2015. And I would say that 2020 was probably the worst. There was some other things going on that year too that were like kind of a bummer. But this season, I think is definitely number two. I looked back at my notes and I just, I feel like a broken record in ways that I haven't in years past with match reviews. Every match feels like that deja vu of high level quality, moments that you feel like something great is possible, but then ever present are the disappointing moments in between. And honestly, yes, it does feel like insanity. Me doing every one of these match reviews, feeling like even if the result is different, that the whole totality of the way Barcelona plays is going to be different for 90 minutes. But I still stick by it, not to be optimistic or positive about the future, but I watch so many of these players with other teams throughout their careers and we've known what they're capable of. Barca does have their injuries. They do have, they do have a few excuses, but the talent on display is so much better than the results. And I will just dig my heels in, at least until the end of this season, that the talent that Barcelona has is so much lower than what they are capable of right now. And to me, that's more frustrating than saying, and I do think it's a lazy thing to say, to say this player, this player, let me name you okay, Barcelona's 12 first team players right now or 13 first team players. But for me to list you, hey, you've got to get 15 of the 19 first team players. That's what I see. 15 of the 19 names in Barcelona's first team that are registered, now 20 with Fermin Lopez. You say to me, hey, I want 14 or 15 of those players. Get them out of my club because Barcelona need to raise some money. And you should get this player and this player and this player. And you know that's not possible. And I do think that Barcelona, in terms of their first team, again, only 20 registered players, 
But I think 15 of those players, I won't tell you which five, but you can you get the idea. But you know who those five are. I think at least 15 of those 20 could be on a side that's winning the Liga if this team was more of a sum of its parts than just individuals who have really, really good moments. Including the 63rd minute, by the way, the Lewandowski goal. Cancelo to Gundogan, one touch back to Lewandowski. Really nice movement again by Gundogan, who I've been mentioning him in passing. I don't have like a big rant on him, but he was getting in behind again. And this proves to me, even though Barcelona in three with Christensen, this kind of game is another reason why I think it makes a lot of sense to play Pedri and Gundogan kind of in those high interiors together with Pedri a little bit to the left. But Gundogan's also getting in behind well, like having those two, Pedri and Gundogan kind of switch, say one of you is cutting in behind as the inverted forward as that midfielder. And then the other one drops in, of course, to support and receive the ball from Christensen, who, of course, is not playing those long balls forward. And I will say this also was a confident finish by Lewandowski. But when you look at the Liga table, Lewandowski, because of his standard, I know he's frustrated about the criticism, but he's still a few goals away for me to say his number is equal to what is a good season by his standard. I'm judging him by his own standards of the past. And even with this goal, again, good, confident finish, sure. But A, the result didn't go Barcelona's way in totality. And B, he just needs a few more of these to really get that confidence up and make you feel like he can get Barcelona out of a problem. That's what your striker is supposed to do. Find you points in the Liga. Same with your goalkeeper. Find you points in the Liga when you probably don't deserve them. And Barcelona have had to earn every point they've gotten in the Liga this season. Because headline four is Barca stinks. This is pretty rough, but at this point, they do. 66 minute when that goal scored 3-2. I mean, Barca stinks. They were 2-2 for three minutes. That is Maybe their mentality stinks. How about I say that? I'll change the headline on the fly. And Barca's mentality must stink. Because the 3-2 comes three minutes after the Hong lacrosse. And Ignasi Miguel, another former La Masia player, by the way, went to Arsenal around the same time as Cesc Fabregas did. I didn't even watch this one back. Somebody or everybody left him open. Scores with a free header. Granada has 26 goals now in the league this season. Five of those are against Barcelona. That is terrible. Barca has given up 33 goals in the league. That's more than Girona, Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid, Athletic Club, Real Betis, Real Sociedad, Valencia, Alaves, Rayo Vallecano, Mallorca, and the same number as relegation zone finding themselves in Cadiz. Barca has more or the same number of goals conceded as 11 of the 20 La Liga teams. That cannot happen. You can never win the Liga that bad defensively. Soon after, Christensen came off for Fermin Lopez, and there was no penalty on the set piece when Kubarsi went down. I think there was an argument for it. I didn't watch it back a million times. But after the Vita Roque stuff, I already gave my opinion on the referees in the Liga, and I'd say throw this one on the pile if you want to. I don't think it's high on the list this season, but again, just throw it in there. 75th minute, Rafinha on for Cancelo. And Barcelona could have got to 3-3 soon after that. Inigo Martinez was offside, canceling out the Fermin Lopez finish on the set-piece delivery. Would have been a pretty goal, but Inigo Martinez offside. Headline 5, I could have also called this one Silver Lining or something like that, because Lemini Mall is 16 years old, and it is such a joy. And I've been saying it the last few weeks, I'm terrified of burning the kid out, but it's so tough because he has to be on the field. They will not, that being Barcelona, the way they're playing with the confidence of this team and especially when Ferran Torres went down too and they're short on attackers. The medium all, he needs to be on the field or Barca won't get a positive result. The 3-3, it's all him. Took the ball away confidently, didn't commit the foul, had time to line it up as he came in on his favorite left foot. Well taken, finds the back of the net. A brace, a brace for 16-year-old the medium all. So hats off to him, man of the match, even though Barca drew 3-3. He's the man of the match. Don't have to blink twice. He was the option and that's my only concern around Lamini Mall, my only feedback. You know, with young players, I don't really have too many negative things to say because they're still learning. That's how Hector Fort is. That's how Pau Gabarsi is and Mark Gu. The mistakes, even Vita Roque, he's a teenager. Part of me always wants to do that with Gabi and Pedri too. Pedri just turned 21 a few months ago. Like he's still really, really young. So all these young players, it's kind of all positivity for me. But Lamini Mall is more than that. I don't have anything there to say. He has been Barcelona's best forward in the second half of this season. I know we're only a month in, but... We're now a whole month where Barcelona's best player has been 16. And usually I'd be like, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> the future is now. But it's not. It means that there are other players who are making 10 times what he's making or equal to what he might make someday if he keeps doing this or more than that. And yet they're not holding up their end of the bargain. Ter Stegen, huge glove save from him, though. 82nd minute. I will give a compliment to him a minute after the goal. Barcelona almost conceded a fourth from Granada, but a huge glove save. 
got me to say welcome back to Stegen. And then it was another attempt at the back post that Barcelona was able to handle. 84th minute, the header by Gundogan on the cross on Lamini Mall. This was the other one I was mentioning that Lamini Mall just best crosses on the team, best 1v1 dribbling on the team. And now that he's beginning to blossom into a scorer as well, yeah, I mean, he's Barcelona's best forward. And that would mean that he's Barcelona's best player because forwards are the ones who impact the game. That's why they make the big money they do. 89th minute, speaking of forwards, Mark Yu on for Pedri. Didn't really have enough time, but almost did. Because in the 90th minute, Mark Yu's on the field for like a minute. And Lamini Mall, almost a magical, lofting look. And Mark Yu, the header, not on goal from Lamini Mall. And that is the state of Barcelona. I think it sums it up. That it was almost a teenager to a barely older than him teenager. They were going to have to win the game from Barcelona. I don't want to go so crazy about the academy. I want to try to take these individual academy kids and understand their contributions to the first team this season individually and, and say, this is what Lamini Mall does. This is what Kubarsi does. Instead of saying, La Masia will save us and all these platitudes about how the academy is the future. And you know, I just feel like that winds up being really reductive to what these individual players have done. Because as I said, the fifth headline was the one positive from this terrible match that should have been three points at home, but was not, is that Lamini Mall is truly special. Now, again, Celta de Vigo, Xavi, you've got about a week still, but I don't want to see him start. I'm tired of it. Rafinha, he came back, played on the left, felt a little bit weird, but hopefully Rafinha gets his fitness back and you can rotate Lamini Mall because you want to save him for Napoli, which, a reminder, is less than 72 hours after that Celta Vigo match. So rotate Lamini Mall so we can start against Napoli. This, this is not rocket science. I, I think Xavi's going to do that. I hope. I hope. With the Champions League, by the way, the following week from this week, I'm taking a little break midweek from the current team, unless something comes up that requires an emergency podcast, of course. And you know, because of Drama Lona every week, it feels like there's a million reasons to have a new show, but truly it's got to be something that's actually happening. I'll do an emergency podcast, but I do have some big stuff that's very time consuming planned for this week, which those who've been with me for a long time, or especially my patrons, you know that history, that word might be involved there. So I did a collaboration with another big Barca content maker. So that's a little teaser, and we have got something very special for you coming out hopefully sometime later this week. Again, it's a big project. We put it on the schedule. That means we're going to try to get it done. So you don't miss that, though. Remember, subscribe to the channel on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. That's a great help. Or you help me out on Patreon. I put everything up on Patreon without the ads as well. So that can save you a good, what, five, 10 minutes a day, which is great. So Patreon, as low as $3. As I said, I put up everything on Patreon, so you won't miss any of the content that I'm making. And as always, until next time, though, Forza Barca.